To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Those words by poet William Blake, written over 150 years ago, could well apply to these young students who attend a school that stands at the forefront of educational theory and practice today. CBS presents For Our Times. Today, to see a world. Here is CBS News correspondent Douglas Edwards. Ever since the 19th century, America has been rich in experimental schools. Schools concerned with ways to help young people develop their individual capacities to the fullest. They've been the catalyst in motivating and developing the administrators and teachers in our public school system. One of the most distinguished is the Wilhelm Scully in Houston, Texas. Located in a converted two-story office building, its unpretentious exterior belies the fact that inside, about 100 students, ranging from age 2 to 15, are involved in school programs as varied and unusual as the modern buildings that surround them. As Houston experiments in architectural design, so does the Wilhelm Scully pursue its unique course of being what they call a cosmopolis with activities stemming from and leading to a harmonious whole, a global family. Its curriculum focuses on physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual wholeness with the emphasis on tying the arts into the sciences, mathematics, philosophy, and the story of civilization. It is not merely a school, it is a community of spirit, wherein a supportive family environment is combined with a holistic educational program. For 17 years, these principles have been nurtured by the founder and director, Marilyn Wilhelm. Whenever you use the arts, and we use the arts to teach everything else, we use it like an encyclopedia, uh, people immediately equate it with an elite. And uh, this doesn't happen when you come to the school, but those who hear about it uh, without entering the school have that feeling. Uh, or they have the feeling that we're a dance school or a music school or an art school, not realizing that we use the arts to expand all academic curricula. It's both verbal and visual, the oldest way to teach. There's nothing original there. How does this differ from some of, some of the Chinese paintings that you all have done? It's tragic for our culture that we equate the arts with an elite because beauty civilizes, and we need beauty. We need the arts. It nourishes and uh, makes the best part of us grow. The arts are the, the, the whole part of it because as a cosmopolis, if education is to prepare us for that citizenship, you can walk from one end of the earth to the other and not become a citizen of the universe. It is by reading the great literature of the world. It's by committing to memory the great poetry of the world. It is by listening, it is by playing, it is by singing, it is by dancing the great music of the world. It's by coming to an understanding of the great art of the world that we have our own personal brush with greatness and become that citizen of the universe, which is the key to our survival. Not stacking up bombs, but coming to understand, to love one another. What did Auden say? We must love one another or die. And so we speak the same vocabulary, which is evidenced in the arts as well as in the sciences. And once we can't become aware of that fact, then as Anatole France would say, we see our commonality, we lay down our arms and we embrace one another. That's the sacred duty of the schools, to unite us. If I may quote H.G. Wells, uh, civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. I think that we need to revise totally the Western education because it's self-centered. Uh, and self-centeredness is nothing but arrogance and ignorance joined together, those twins. We cannot, we cannot uh, uh, stand this kind of a self-centeredness. It is a menace to our survival. It is a denial of a world community. Many different cultures and backgrounds are represented at the school and most of the children come from homes of working parents. 
Serving as an extended family, it is open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and parents are encouraged to visit the school as often as possible. Many evenings are spent in discussion of the curriculum with Mrs. Wilhelm. Spinoza, Sufi, Pythagoras, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad, and they are saying the same thing in a slightly different way. Five years ago in Houston, 57% of all the children in the schools, their mothers were in the working force. And of course that has grown uh, since that time. So these are parents that do care about their children. You hear of the latchkey children. I think that facts are facts. They're not going to change because we don't like them. Uh, I've been campaigning for them to open the public schools for 10 years. They, we have all the facilities there. You just have to unlock the doors. Bring in your older adults, the young people who are looking for jobs, and have um, before and after school care because these children are wandering the streets and no supervision. One of the great books of the world. It's known as War and Peace. It was written we are all born Leo gifted. Tolstoy. We define gifted not in the defining term that is used today as an elite. Tarkovsky someone above and beyond the others. But a concept that to be gifted is to be in the presence of something given. And we have all been given gifts. Uh, it's tied up with the purpose of life. You see, I believe that unless we approach the uh, question of what is the purpose of life, does life have a purpose, that you can't even get involved in the question of education itself. Now what has happened is that rumor is that there are troops crossing the border of Russia. And so I want you to see in your mind's eye the women of Russia with their big skirts and their petticoats. Do you know what a babushka is? They were they... on Fiddler on the Roof yesterday. Oh, and Fiddler on the yes. Roof? Well, then now you know what I'm talking about. So they have their babushkas on, and some of them are kneeling and praying, and others are crying. Men are wearying. They're going to have to leave their homes. What we are teaching at our school is rejected knowledge. This is knowledge that everyone has. It's not neglected. It is actually rejected because it does not fit the values of our materialistic society. Plato said, all learning is a kind of remembering. You cannot put an idea into anyone. And these ideas that we're trying to transmit it is the formation of the human character that we're truly concerned about because if you develop that, that, that sense of destiny, uh, the, the Greeks define knowledge as character. Uh, when you do that, then they will know that life has a purpose. Uh, this is why the children love to learn, why they try their hardest. The Wilhelm program is competency-based which means that students are grouped according to their abilities, regardless of age. Their achievement is measured in relation to their ability, and the school is fully accredited by the state of Texas. Although there is a permanent faculty, many classes are taught by visiting scholars from local colleges, who find the school's curriculum and the students' enthusiasm a rewarding experience. Intrigued by Mrs. Wilhelm's approach to education, distinguished artists, authors, educators, and medical professionals visit the school regularly. Uh, we are not all created equal, but we should have equal opportunity. And what has happened, it, it's not, again, nothing new or original at our school, it's the little red schoolhouse brought up to date. And the most wonderful thing that I think comes out of this competency-based program in that you're not holding anyone back, you're not pushing anyone forward. It is not only the best way to teach them academically, but also to develop them socially. Uh, you lose this pack instinct uh, where someone is vying to be a leader, and it's replaced by a most healthy atmosphere that everyone is an example. Now, Bradley, you have five fingers, and you bite off three of them. Now, how many do you have count? One, two. That's it. That's how many you have? Two. Good. Most schools segregate children according to age, so there's no interaction of the young with the older or the old. The school has got to assume a role that it has never had before. It's got to become uh, an extended family. I see the school as the last bastion of hope. It's the last citadel of civilization. If we fail there, 
We've failed it all. Now you say it, Funk. <laughs> Ethics and values are not being taught. In that idea of keeping church and state separate, we've thrown out the baby with the bathwash because ethics and values can be taught without dogma. You see, we speak a spiritual vocabulary that is the same in every age and in every culture and in every language without exception. The spiritual underpinnings, the foundation of every religion is basically the same. Then you have nuances where they change and diverge and you become a Jew or a Christian or a Zoroastrian or a Confucian or whatever. But basically you have the foundation is exactly the same. And this is why I feel that if we would include in the curriculums of the school, not dogma, but the basic fundamental spiritual values of the great uh, religions, that this would lead to international understanding. What did Mark Twain say? That true irreverence is disrespect for another man's God. And that's because there is only one God. There is not another God. He is worshipped in many ways. As he approached, so he becomes. And this is a, not a inspiring or instilling a tolerance, but a respect for others. And that's what we need. Education is the only way we're going to be able to do it. If a student's concentration should wander, they are surrounded by art and aphorisms hung on every available wall space in the school classrooms and hallways. They're changed regularly, and often paintings are accompanied by a child's interpretation. They are surrounded by their heritage, verbally and visually. Just because they're short doesn't mean that they aren't thinking about life and death and does life have meaning. And these aphorisms bring them that sense of security and direction. Monday's no fun day, why are we here? There is a metaphysical center around which the entire curriculum evolves. This is an education through philosophy, as Aristotle and Plato defined it as the map of life. And this is what we're teaching, a, a science of choice and an understanding of the unity and oneness of all things. And so you see echoed in poetry, in music, in art, in geography, in mathematics. No matter which way you start, you keep revolving around this center of oneness, of unity, of the sacredness of all life. You go into Dr. Vias's class and they are learning fractions. They are learning the golden rule as manifested in mathematics. Does your mother give an ice cream cone to you and not to your brother? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's right there in that equation or whatever. If I divide that by five, what do I get? One. Now, what must I do to the denominator? Divide that. Why? Just what as you use the denominator. The what is the word we Just must? Yes. We cannot live without justice. Yes. What's the best way to sow discontent? People will fight to the end for justice. They will, much faster than they will for money or anything else. Okay, just as these three students are the population of California, all 15 of you are the population of Japan. Would you sit on those chairs? It's the same way in geography. And we tie that again with the arts. We see Japan as the forerunner. They have met many of the problems that we in the West are now encountering with so many people. Imagine they have paper, rice paper thin walls. It's the most densely populated country in all the world. What the Japanese have learned to do, crowded as you are, is they have learned to look inside themselves. They have learned when their houses are next to one another and they're made out of paper and you can hear, they have learned not to hear. They have learned the art of silence. And it's inner silence they have learned. And do you see why they have learned that? Do you also see why the Japanese are a much less violent people than we are? Can you imagine if in California, all Californians were that crowded, what would happen? They have taken these arts. They are all therapeutic arts, all forms of meditation. They are exquisite ways of creating silence. They're not popping drug pills to calm one down, but they are intimate with the masterpieces of God.
which they believe that when you are intimate with these masterpieces, one can harbor no evil thought, that there is a peace that comes to you and spiritual realization takes place. So for the children to understand that the arts lead to a higher level of existence, to peace and to harmony. Let's say soy altogether. Soy. During this school year, there's been particular emphasis on China, with classes conducted by visiting artists and educators specializing in Chinese history and culture. Uh, doctor, this morning we were going over the wonderful aphorism from China, all under heaven, one family. And I wonder, would you teach us to write family in Chinese? Sure. We have one, draw the picture with me. How about that? All right, Monica, you want to try with Dr. Sun? Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> so every one family live in the house. Right. Let's draw a Chinese house. The roof first. The Chinese, I feel, uh, hold in, in their wisdom and experience. Uh, there's much that we can learn from them. They have the medicine that we really need for the spiritual ills that we find here in the West. We go here. We go here. One, two. We don't want to develop parrots. And, and, uh, so we reward questions at our school, not answers. To know what to ask is to know half the answer. There's a marvelous Chinese proverb that goes with this. He who asks a question is a fool for a moment. He who does not ask a question is a fool forever. So we try to imbue the children in that, that ask questions and don't be afraid of errors. We don't learn from the things we know, we learn from the things we don't know. So if you make a mistake or an error, you just cross it out. We don't use erasers there at school. Because this means you're trying something new that you haven't tried before. You're stretching. You're going forward. Look at here. Oh, that's The tree, the family, the house. The dog. Everything's here. The dancers are here. The dancers are coming. Often, during literature classes, Mrs. Wilhelm will ask the students to stop what they're doing, choose a costume from the extensive wardrobe closet, and improvise a scene from the classic they're currently studying. In this case, segments of Tolstoy's War and Peace. Nonviolence is a continuing theme. Well, my friends, I've heard some of your views. Some of you will not agree with me. But by the authority entrusted to me by my czar and country, order a retreat. Retreat will be our weapon. We will yield without a battle and overcome Bonaparte. I agree with Kutuzov. We undereducate children by underestimating them. They can understand anything. They understand the most profound ideas, and it's become a part of them. So we mustn't underestimate them. As you know, Tolstoy was greatly influenced by Lao Tzu. And then Lao Tzu, uh, through Tolstoy, uh, influenced Gandhi and Martin Luther King and many others. But the root of this nonviolence movement is Lao Tzu. They will never forget that Russians are no different than the rest of us. They have mothers, they have fathers, they have dogs, horses, sisters, brothers, and they want peace. We all are striving for the same thing. This is why the arts are the encyclopedia of ideas, ideals. They are the encyclopedia of the human spirit. And the human spirit is the same in all ages and in all cultures. So let us say that we will yield and save Mother Russia. We will yield now and save Mother Russia. Let me hear you say that. We will yield now and save Mother Russia. Yes. Let us. Pray for peace. Let us pray for peace. O oh God, save, save thy people. people. The children are never referred to as younger or older, but as shorter or taller. Nearly half of the school's enrollment is short, under five years of age. Many will continue on into the upper grades, and the foundation gained during these early years will make their studies that much more meaningful when they're tall. 
El gato, el gato es, es verde. verde. Everyone. El gato es verde. Learning different languages is a priority. This Spanish class is being conducted by the grandmother of one of the children. Blanco, everybody say it. This is a cosmopolis. They cannot go through life uh, with just English. And again, that's very arrogant to think everyone should be speaking English. And furthermore, as Leibniz said, that he who gains another language gains another soul. We're not sitting anyone down and we're gluing them to the chair and we're boring a hole and pouring knowledge in. You can't do that. Uh, but we're making, uh, learning the fun game it should be. Grandmothers used to do this at home. These are the children that we see the greatest flowering. Although we do have many children come and join us when they are older, but the ones that we have had from three or four, uh, uh, there's usually evidence of that background. You see, the other thing too, is that the older children are teaching the younger children and they're teaching them what they're learning. Uh, this is the school assuming the role of family. Uh, we can't lose family. It's the taproot of civilization. We need to create as many avenues as possible for these children to both receive and to give love. Good. Friendship means equality. And today, when the political situation is intermingled with great racial tension, uh, I think it's essential that we look at other civilizations and other cultures that they have as much to give to us as we have to give to them. So if we're going to get to, to know them, I think that the schools should provide the opportunity for the students to understand them. And to better understand other cultures and to make what they've studied more meaningful, the Wilhelm Scully program includes a number of field trips to various museums and historic points of interest throughout the state. Here, in keeping with the ongoing study of China, some of the children visited an exhibit of treasures from Shanghai at the Houston Museum of Fine Arts. And in Herman Park stands a dramatic sculpture by Hannah Stewart. She invited the children to her studio to see a work in progress called The Sentinel, depicting the seven traditional cultures. You are the guardian of civilization. We as teachers must transmit to you the wisdom of our ancestors, the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Indians, the Greeks, the Hebrews, the uh, Arabs, the Persians, and then you are the next link. Field trips are not limited to Houston, and it was a special occasion when a group of students, accompanied by several teachers and parents, boarded a bus for a three-day trip to Austin and San Antonio. At the State House in Austin, they had the opportunity to meet the governor of Texas, Mark White. And nearby, at the Henry Ransom Art Center, they were surrounded by Greek statuary and amazed the University of Texas Dean of Classics, Dr. Carl Galinsky, with their knowledge of Greek history. In San Antonio, there were guests of Dr. Amy Freeman Lee, a renowned scholar and humanitarian who serves as a board member of the school. Here at Incarnate Word College, they had the opportunity for a little rest and relaxation and to write a daily account of their trip. Newly elected to the Texas Hall of Fame, Dr. Lee was particularly anxious for the children to visit the state's most famous historic landmark, the Alamo. And I've often wondered when we talk about the battles that we fought, whether we could have gotten together in those days and, and, and talked it out, you see and how you tie that time into today. Remember today, it is possible through nuclear energy to kill everybody on this earth. And so now we no longer have the privilege of fighting it out, because if we fight it out, we'll kill everybody on the planet eventually. We must now sit down and talk it out. So if you don't have this... And at the Institute of Texan Cultures, Dr. Carolyn Black explains some of the traditional Indian folklore. A group of Boy Scouts who'd been studying Indian culture included the children in a ceremonial dance. The well-known San Antonio Festival included a performance of Carmen at the picturesque Armisen Theater. 
Here, the children attended a rehearsal and were invited to participate in one of the scenes. A highlight of the trip was a Mexican dinner by candlelight on one of the flat boats that cruise along the San Antonio River through the city. The final stop was the beautiful McNay Gallery, where the famous Rodin sculptor, the Burgers of Calais, is on exhibit. You see that in the gestures of these people, you can feel their thoughts. And here the children saw an original Cezanne landscape, a painting they were familiar with, but only through small reproductions. And when you come to Cezanne, he is like an oriental artist. He wants to you to come from the back to the front. And like an oriental artist, he always leaves something for the imagination. You must complete the paintings. With the visual arts as the centerpiece of all of their studies, it was appropriate that the school was invited to contribute to a collection of children's artworks from 80 countries throughout the world. This international exhibit was on display at the United Nations under the sponsorship of UNICEF and was arranged by the Foundation of Children's History, Art and Culture in Oslo, Norway. The Wilhelm Scully's paintings paid tribute to all those who have contributed to our common heritage. The Wilhelm Scully credo states, where there is love, there is concern. Where there is concern, there is kindness. Where there is kindness, there is harmony. Where there's harmony, there is helpfulness. Where there is helpfulness, there is cooperation. And where there is cooperation, there is civilization. Perhaps Dr. Lee articulated best how this credo can apply to the children of today's complex society. We must move ahead rapidly, yesterday, if we hope to survive on the planet, with this kind of an approach, the holistic approach, the kind of approach that says, first we must learn how to live on the level of a human being, and then we learn how to make a living. I don't want to be misunderstood about this. I'd be the last in the world. I come from a business family. I come from the philosophy of the possibility of benevolent capitalism. We all have to make a living. We make it blood, sweat, and tears, or we marry it, or we inherit a little bit, or whatever. But it has to be made. But what I'm saying is, what good does it do to know how to be a doctor and be a mere technician if you don't know why you should be a doctor to serve? So first you learn to be a human being. And that's what's going on at this school, to help the children discover their innate potential and develop that innate potential to the maximum. For what reason? So that they can have capabilities to serve the common will, not to be selfish, to make the choice, as Mrs. Wilhelm says to them over and over, to give and to receive love. Some ideas come and go, but true ideas